Okay, so um, pain. And um, yeah, I've had a lot of experience with uh, pain, and especially physical pain or, or an emotional pain. He here's the thing with uh, pain is that um, I, you know, I was really, really lucky to be exposed to the teachings of Dr. David R. Hawkins. And, and um, so <clears throat> pain can come about due to um, repressed feelings. Also, it can, do, can be due to karma, you know, like what one has done to others in the past lifetime. If they're still unresolved and there's guilt. Mm. You know, like in the last lifetime, you know, probably a few lifetimes ago, I was probably in some kind of war, probably skewering people and hacking people's heads off and, uh, and uh, putting spears in them and stuff like that. So, you know, there can be a lot of, uh, a lot of um, stuff, you know, and uh, so it might have even been devious, you know, stab someone for their money or something. So just to get, get their belongings or who knows, maybe I was... They had the girl I liked, so I just disposed of the guy, you know, and stabbed him in the back while I wasn't looking. So, <laughs> so, so there can be karmic reasons, there can be emotional, emotional pain, symbolically, you know, <clears throat> I was a pain in the neck to someone or a pain in the back to someone. Yes. You know, I had, you know, I've had some kids oh. and I was just a constant pain in the neck to them. Mm -hmm. And this time, this lifetime, I've suddenly got like horrible pain in the neck or pain in the back or I might be doing that to someone in, in this lifetime mm. you know just being a pain, pain in the neck uh, to someone so these you know so we can the guilt all that guilt uh, and also the symbolic nature of the karma and what one has done and the unresolved karma as well our repressed feelings can come out of one also you know the more repressed feelings one has you know one goes down to these lower vibrations, and the lower the vibration, you know, you're in a you're in an attractive field, mm. uh, which will then correlate and bring something out of the collective, which will yeah. correlate to how much guilt mm. and shame and fear you've got. So if I'm holding, if I've just got a little bit of shame and guilt and fear and anger, then I might get like a mild headache that passes in in a few days, you know. But if I've got like huge amounts of unresolved karma, repressed feelings, unresolved, haven't done any spiritual work, repressed feelings, lots of belief systems, mm -hmm. then, you know, I'm like, that's like a magnet. I might get something like cancer or, you know, I might have an accident and break my back, you know, all kinds of things. So, <clears throat> so you know, it can vary. So some, some can be very chronic and some can be very minor. Um, <clears throat> So, the thing with pain, so one of the things to deal with pain, like I had, um, I had all kinds of pains, but one of them was um, uh, gout. I used to have gout pains. Actually, it was quite funny, that one, because I had gout, and, and actually, um, Hawkins had about 23 illnesses he let go of, and one of them was gout as well. I got a chance to meet him and ask him about it. Mm. Um, and when I shook his hand, I felt like tingling in my toes because he had that vibration of tra having transcended the belief system and felt the feelings out and had disappeared. Mm -hmm. But um, all you do is, whenever there was a gout attack, my feet would just swell up like a balloon. And it was quite horrific, because it would go red and it would just stretch. And so you'd have the most horrific pain. Mm -hmm. And I would just put my foot on a pillow and I would just do, feel the feelings, which was not label it, not make a story about it and just welcome the energy, just be one with the energy, which was excruciating in the beginning. But just by doing that, uh, by doing that, and, really, and I think in the early days, I do remember it. I, I remember once sitting with the, I think, I think this is accurate, uh, as to my memory, four hours. I had my foot on the pillow <clears throat> and it was excruciating because it's like you have your toe and then suddenly it just swells up. The skin stretches. And it's a massive inflammatory response, <clears throat> mm. you know, so it really is really, really bad. And so I was there and it was like very, very intense and I was letting go of the labelling. And then eventually you let go and, and you, eventually it starts to get less and less as you're one with it and not going into the thoughts, not labelling. And then eventually, and also I learnt, you know, that you stop, even later on as it becomes more diffuse, even stop the, stop the idea of pain even location, start letting go of the idea of location as well. 
so it becomes more and more and more diffuse. And then you'd get into this, uh, and the end it would be like there'd just be like peace, just serenity and peace, and no awareness of body or anything, just non-local peace. And it'd be fine, it'd be great. And then it's like you'd get up, and it would still be like puff, but there'd be no pain, and you'd walk. But after a few steps, it would start to again start mm. to start to go. So it would be wonderful that you could go take out all the pain and even allow a few steps. But over the months of doing that, the attacks got less and less frequent and less intense. Mm. And the capacity to fill them out got better and better. Mm. And then after, I think, about three to five years, they stopped completely mm. and, and the medication was stopped and they've, they've never come back. And that was the same process I used with the asthma as well and also on the exhaustion with the uh, kidney failure. Now the other thing to know is one of the things, so that's like, uh, that's one way, but you know, one of the things I learned uh, as well was, you know, to be with the feelings, if you can be with the feelings to practice, when you get an acute attack, to be with it in the instant it happens, you know. If you can be with it in the instant and have especially something acute, it, you can have the most miraculous uh, experiences. And, um, I, you know, I remember with cramp, I'd get them in the morning, and if I caught them in the split second and went into them, in the split second they started, I wouldn't get a cramp. It like, mm -hmm. would vanish in a split second. Mm -hmm. And if I resisted for the first second, then the whole cramp would come up. So I learned that. I remember once, so these are just my experiences. I remember once, like, I had, I was about to have, um, you know, I was an overeater in my early days, and they, they told me not to have high potassium foods. And I binged out on bananas because I was quite ill at the time, I was a food addict. And I had a blood test done, they said, you have to come in, you're about to have a heart attack uh, for emergency treatment. And they gave me, they had this big needle, and uh, they were going to administer this thing to bring my potassium levels down with this huge needle. It was like, not the normal needle to take blood, but this big, big thing to really put it up the artery. Uh, uh, and uh, I saw this huge thing and I thought this is a great opportunity because it looked quite scary to practice feel the feelings and you know as they plunge it in you know to, to practice fully experiencing it with no resistance no thought just 100% one with them plunging the, the needle in. Were and you I, looking at it? I was looking at it as well. Okay. So I wanted to like you know not resist in any way as they plunged it in. Yeah. So I was like right on the razor's edge of just feeling it. And it's quite interesting, as they plunged it in, I started to lose consciousness, because I was just focusing on being 100% present. And I started to go off into bliss. And I actually started to like drop down, because I was going up into heaven. You know, I went off into this wonderful, beautiful place. And they had to like, they, they suddenly like, went into a panic, because I was like, going to flop over. And one of the nurses, th I think, thought I was a diabetic. <laughs> I was an overeater, it was quite hilarious. So they said, bring some sugary drinks, he's diabetic, you know. So they just gave me loads of like these uh, strawberry milkshake thing, drinks, things. So I had, they woke me up with all that kapaf and I drank the, the drinks. But it, it worked. I just saw it like if you can stay on the razor's edge, you don't feel anything. You know, you go straight off into bliss if you just be one with it from the, from the first second. And don't, don't back away, don't resist, don't go into thought. You just want to be one with the feeling. So I had that, and then, you know, after, you know, I was on a dialysis machine, and then um, I got on, I suddenly had this thing where I was on a waiting list for a transplant for a kidney. And one, um, I won't go into it, but one morning I got a phone call, you know, there's a donor. I went into the hospital, <clears throat> and I had this thing of like, I don't really want to take painkillers, if, if, if necessary, to blot out. I'd really like to feel everything, because I knew that if you feel everything, the healing can be very rapid, mm -hmm. you know, and I, in, it, actually it was impossible to say to stop the general, but afterwards I could say I don't want anything. And I remember saying, um, <clears throat> you know, they came with the, the nurse before the operation came with the morphine part, said I don't want it. She was really angry, this nurse saying, you know, th probably thought I was loony or something, like I don't mm -hmm. want the morphine part. part. Anyway, so I said that I let her attach it, but I had no intention of using it. And then after, when I woke up from consciousness, I said, <clears throat> I said to the nurse, I don't want any painkillers at all. Mm -hmm. and I didn't use the morphine pump once, and I told them not to give me anything. And I just went through this, the surgery pain when I woke up from the general anaesthetic. 
and took no no painkillers. I did have to. It was it was like having like a it felt like having a kitchen knife in in mm. abdomen. That's what it felt like. It was pretty. It was super super intense. But I just did the Lord's prayer. And I was with it. I was with that feeling, and I was with the feeling and doing the Lord's prayer with the feeling. It was excruciating, you know. And it was fine if I just said the prayer and was with it constantly. Uh, if I resi if I resisted, it would go up even more. I realized after several hours that I would get no sleep because it would be like it had been several hours of high intensity. Mm. And then I'd, I'd taken on with me like a, um, an MP3 player with Muji on, going to the observer, you know, which I'd forgotten to practice going to the observer of the pain. Mm. So I just put the thing on and, uh, you know, he was saying, doing a guided with someone else for something else, not pain, but he was just saying, go to the observer. So go to the observer, it's like, okay, so I went to, and then suddenly, it was, this happened in one second. There's like the observer, and then there was no, con I was out, in the deepest sleep ever. You know, I had the deepest sleep ever, in one split second, as soon as it was like, be the observer, and that was grace, it was like, gone. You know, and I had the deepest sleep, like no nothing, and then woke up later, and then the pain was went after a few hours after uh, a night's sleep. So, hence the thing of like being with those feelings and not going into distraction. And also the thing of like, if you can catch something with no distraction from the beginning, mm -hmm. then, and then you don't even experience it. You know, mm -hmm. so, so if someone's just about to cut your hand off or put a nail through you or whatever, if you do that, you won't feel anything. But if you've got something chronic, then you know you just be with it over and over again, and it, and it will dissolve. So that's how you do. That will also work for emotional pain, as well. Just mm -hmm. being with it. The observer is just the observer. If you're not familiar with the observer, is just as your whatever is being <coughs> experienced. Don't go into your thoughts. Just be. There's something that's observing the thoughts and the feelings, which is not the thoughts and the feelings. So be that, it's not a mental thing, be the observer. Mm -hmm. Like right here, there is an observation of everything going on with, you know, that is watching all the thoughts coming and going, that is, uh, that is observing any sense of location, that is observing even time. And that observer is here now. So if you drop, er you know, if you drop everything, because everything, <clears throat> anything that is being experienced now is, is passing and changing. So there is something here which observes everything that can pass and change, and it's always here, you see. So if there's thoughts going on, they're always going this way and that way, but the observer of the thoughts is not the thoughts. The observer of time passing is not time. Even if there's a sense of the location of the body, that which is observing the location of the body is not the location of the body. So that which observes location is locationless. So something is here which is observing location which is not in location. It has no location. Something is here which is observing thoughts passing which is not a thought. It's thoughtless. Something is here which is aware, well not really aware, but time passes before it, but it is not in time. And that is always here. It has to be here because if something passes, there has to be something <coughs> here which is not passing, which can see the passing go. Mm. You see? Like if, if a man suddenly runs in here, like in those cricket grounds, like a naked man or a naked woman, suddenly runs across, this, runs across the field, you're not that person just because they suddenly run across. Mm. You're the observer. Mm -hmm. You see, it's a, it's a confusion to think you are the thing, even if, if you believe you're the thing, you believe it, but you're not the thing, the past. You're, you're, the, you're the eternal, observation which is unpassing. So whatever is in this room, if you detach from it, there's something here which is not, not anything, actually it's not in form, it's not, it's not a feeling, it's not a thought, it's not time, it's not, in, it's not location, so what is it? Because the ultimate is like when you go into a cinema, you know, as soon as you, you're in a cinema theatre and the images go past, on the screen, you can get hypnotized and think you're the character on the screen. But actually, even if that 
hypnosis was going on your whole life and you thought you were the character on the screen, actually you were, you were the observer. You were actually nothing to do with what was going on on the screen. Yes. Even if you were hypnotized your whole life, actually there's, there is an observation of that which is not the screen. You know, and that's called waking up. You know, that, that's waking up to who, who you are. <coughs> so, <coughs> so those are the things, feeling the feelings and things. And always have the attitude, I was speaking to someone before, have the attitude of um, when something happens, experience it. Or go to the observer of it. Don't, don't run away from it. And sometimes people will have fear or some resistance to be with the pain or the fear or whatever. Or there might come up exhaustion or tiredness to not to be with it. But then, then feel out the tiredness or the fear and then feel out the pain, you know. So these are just like smoke screens to not, to not be.